RNA sequencing, a new genomic tool entering the clinic. Here is everything you need to know. A presentation by Lees, Brooke, and Vivian as part of the Medical Genomics Program at the University of Toronto. I would like you to meet Bob and his family. Bob is a young child who presents with floppy movements, low muscle tone, and joint tightness, along with other symptoms indicative of congenital muscular dystrophy, or CMD. His parents have been searching for answers, but no one has been able to determine the cause of his disease. The doctors already performed whole exome sequencing, but they only identified one heterozygous missense variant in the gene GMPPB. Even though this gene is found to be associated with muscular dystrophies, most forms of CMD are autosomal recessive, and the identified missense variant is a variant of uncertain significance. So the results from the whole exome sequencing are inconclusive. Without answers from DNA sequencing, what's next for Bob's case? The answer? RNA sequencing. Let's delve into RNA sequencing and how it can be used to find answers that DNA sequencing cannot provide. So what is RNA? First, let's review DNA. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is a double-stranded molecule that contains all our genetic information. It codes for all activities in our cells and is made up of four nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. RNA, or ribonucleic acid, is a single-stranded molecule that is transcribed from DNA and contains the same nucleotides except thymine is replaced with uracil. While there are many types of RNA, messenger RNA, or mRNA, is a specific type of RNA that contains the genetic instructions to produce proteins through the process of translation. When DNA is transcribed into RNA, a series of post-transcriptional modifications are made to mRNAs before translation can begin. The genome refers to our entire set of DNA, while the transcriptome is the collection of all of our mRNA transcripts. Nowadays, targeted gene panels and whole exome sequencing are the most common clinical DNA sequencing tests for diagnosis. These DNA tests allow us to find possible pathogenic variants in specific genes and coding regions of the genome. However, DNA sequencing only examines a small portion of the genome and provides a static picture of the activity. DNA sequencing has an average diagnostic yield around only 40%. Instead, a more dynamic and comprehensive view of the genome can be achieved through assessing the RNA. An analysis of the transcriptome could provide further insights into non-coding regions, such as the regulatory elements, untranslated regions, or UTRs, and introns, as well as the effects of post-transcriptional processes that may otherwise not be detected through examining the DNA sequence. This leads us to RNA sequencing, an approach that uses next-generation sequencing methods to profile the transcriptome. It can quantify the levels of different RNA transcripts in the cells or tissues, providing doctors and scientists with a more in-depth and active view of the patient's genome. With this in mind, Bob's doctors turn to RNA sequencing in hopes of finding answers for his disease and diagnosis. Concept check. Why is RNA analysis helpful for Bob's case? A. It can identify non-coding variants. B. It can uncover the effects of post-transcriptional modifications. C. It can provide an estimate of active protein in the sample, rather than a static view. D. All of the above could be helpful here upon analysis. Now take a moment to pause the video and answer this question. The correct answer is D. All of the above could be helpful here upon analysis. Feel free to rewind the video if you need to review this. RNA sequencing was able to provide answers to Bob and his family by identifying a variant on the second copy of the GMPPB gene. This discovery means that two copies of the gene are faulty, fulfilling the recessive nature of congenital muscular dystrophy. 
The variant was found in the untranslated region, or UTR, of the gene GMPPB. It created a new start codon upstream of the original start site, which was predicted to result in a protein with 29 extra amino acids. However, the mRNA was recognized as abnormal and degraded before the protein would be created, resulting in lowered expression of the GMPPB transcript. RNA sequencing results were extremely helpful to Bob and his family in providing them with an answer for this condition. Now Bob can be adequately treated and the family can be appropriately counseled. Let's dive a bit deeper into how RNA sequencing works. RNA sequencing has four main steps. One, isolation of RNA from the sample. This could be blood or a tissue sample. Two, complementary DNA conversions and sequencing, three, sequence alignment, and four, downstream analysis of the results. Once a sample is collected from the patient, it is quickly sent off to the lab for RNA sequencing. The RNA sequencing process begins by isolating RNA from the sample. At this point, there will be a quality assurance step to ensure the quantity, integrity, and purity of the isolated RNA. If the RNA isolation passes these tests, it will be broken up or fragmented prior to the next step, which is the conversion of the fragmented RNA to complementary DNA, or cDNA, with an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. This cDNA mimics the chemistry of a DNA strand for sequencing purposes, but also contains all of the post-transcriptional modifications of the RNA, representing functional proteins. The cDNA is then amplified and sent for short read sequencing. Once the sequencing data is generated, the sequences are aligned to a reference genome or transcriptome to allow for the assessment of changes and variants in the sample. This marks another important quality control step to ensure sequence quality and alignment statistics are within standards. After the quality assessment, the data will be computationally analyzed to allow for the quantification of expressed genes and transcripts. This data can be interpreted and analyzed in comparison to healthy controls and other tissues to gather as much information as possible and come to a diagnosis. Concept check. Bob's parents go back to his doctor and they go over the RNA sequencing results with him. They ask, what are the main steps of RNA sequencing? What do you answer? A. cDNA conversion and sequencing, RNA isolation, sequence alignment, expression analysis. B. RNA isolation, cDNA conversion and sequencing, sequence alignment, expression analysis. C. RNA isolation, sequence alignment, cDNA conversion and sequencing, expression analysis. D. Sequence alignment, cDNA conversion and sequencing, RNA isolation, expression analysis. Now take a moment to pause the video and answer this question. The correct answer is B. Feel free to rewind the video if you need to review this. The RNA sequencing analysis pipeline can produce a lot of clinically useful data. Let's take a deep dive into how this data can be applied to diagnose patients. The biggest benefit of RNA sequencing is the assessment of the non-coding regions of the genome, as they are often not sequenced or hard to interpret with DNA sequencing data. RNA sequencing can show how these disease-causing variants would directly affect the active RNA transcripts in a sample. RNA sequencing data can be used to explore splicing changes, expression outliers, and allele imbalances, Let's discuss these in a bit more detail. The most validated utilization of RNA sequencing is to explore splicing changes. Splicing refers to the post-transcriptional process that causes a single gene to code for various functional mRNA transcripts. This differential removal or joining of introns and exons can occur via a variety of mechanisms, such as exon skipping, exon extension, exon truncation, and intron retention. Each of these are triggered by different variants within the non-coding regions. Therefore, variants that disrupt splicing events could affect protein structure and activity, leading to disease. RNA sequencing data shows RNA molecules with alternative splicing. 
allowing confirmation of splicing variants related to the disease. Splicing changes can result in disease manifestations for many different disorders. One such example is Duchenne muscular dystrophy and the DMD gene. Variants in the untranslated regions or introns of the DMD gene can cause changes in splicing, leading to the exclusion of functionally important exons in the final mRNA transcript, in turn causing the disease. Although many pathogenic variants can be causal for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other genetic disorders, splice mutations are much easier to assess with RNA sequencing. Next, gene expression data can be extremely diagnostically useful to discern expression outliers. This is defined as an expression that significantly deviates from the normal physiological range. Variants that affect gene regulation or trigger transcript decay can cause either increased or decreased expression of a transcript. This information allows us to infer increased or decreased protein function causal for a disease manifestation. For example, reduced or completely wiped out expression of normal transcripts is indicative of loss of function variants and low protein level, which is causal for many different diseases including cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, Tay-Sachs disease, Parkinson's disease, and more. RNA sequencing data can be useful here to both identify the causal non-coding variants and confirm the results of DNA sequencing with gene expression data. Finally, RNA sequencing data can help resolve allele biases or imbalances. Typically, we have two copies of an allele that are equally expressed. So if one copy of the gene carries a pathogenic variant and expression is biased towards that variant, the disease manifestation could mimic a loss of function mutation. This biasing can be due to variants in the non-coding genome that result in one copy not being expressed, even just partially, skewing to a disease phenotype. Detecting imbalances in expression can also help delineate variable autosomal dominant diseases, like neurofibromatosis, where the severity of symptoms can vary among affected individuals. Concept check. When would it be important to refer a patient for RNA sequencing? A. When you need to detect or confirm a suspected splice variant. B. When you suspect a missing variant for a single gene disease with negative DNA sequencing results. C. When you suspect a missing variant for an autosomal recessive disease with only one variant identified from DNA sequencing. D. When you suspect a regulatory element variant. Now take a moment to pause the video and answer this question. This is a trick question. All of these are appropriate times to refer a patient for RNA sequencing. Feel free to rewind the video and review this concept if you need to. Despite the clear range and clinical power of RNA sequencing, it is not widely implemented in clinical labs to date. Let's explore some of the major challenges. Firstly, analysis of RNA sequencing data is technically challenging. With no universal reference transcriptome, difficulties prioritizing variants and candidate genes, and complicated interpretations, among other technical issues, RNA sequencing struggles to become routine in clinical practice. For these reasons, there is currently no universal or optimal analysis pipeline for all the previously mentioned uses of RNA sequencing, adding further complications. Resolving technical issues with RNA sequencing and establishing lab workflows, analytical pipelines, and defined concepts for clinical interpretation are vital to ensure RNA sequencing-based diagnostic tests are high quality and reproducible. Next is the tissue issue. RNA transcripts are often expressed in tissue or cell-specific manners, that is, Different versions or levels of RNAs may be expressed in different tissues. This is a significant hurdle, as DNA sequencing can be done with minimally invasive blood or buccal samples. However, RNA sequencing data produced from these samples may not be transferable to the tissues being affected by a genetic disorder. For example, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, skeletal muscle tissue is affected by the loss of the protein dystrophin leading to degeneration. A typical blood sample may not reflect this loss of dystrophin expression, like a muscle biopsy sample would. 
There are a few ways researchers are looking to get around the tissue issue, including the transformation of fibroblasts or induced pluripotent stem cells. However, this can be quite time-consuming and labor-intensive and still invasive. Expression signatures using blood samples are also promising as they look at how expression across multiple genes is changed by a disease. However, these require a lot of research and validation prior to clinical use. Although there are significant technical and biological challenges, researchers and clinicians worldwide are working hard to address these issues to make RNA sequencing a more widely accessible and routinely utilized clinical diagnostic test in the near future. Concept check. What is the biggest factor preventing widespread clinical implementation of RNA sequencing? A. Lack of universal analysis pipeline. B. Difficult data interpretation. C. The tissue issue. D. All of the above. Now take a moment to pause the video and answer this question. The answer is D, all of the above. Feel free to rewind this video and review this concept if you need to. RNA sequencing adds immense diagnostic utility, either on its own or in conjunction to whole exome or whole genome sequencing. It is sure that RNA sequencing will become a routine standard of care in the near future. So we hope after watching this video, you have a better understanding of what RNA sequencing is, how it works, where it's applicable, and the difficulties associated with RNA sequencing and RNA data. Thank you for watching along. We hope this video can help provide necessary context to clinicians who may soon be advising patients on this technology.